It's going to be more top-level type of review. And so when I, I won't repeat or recycle an old exam question from the first exam. So trying to memorize the test packet won't, won't help you. It's more of the concepts that I'm interested in you remembering. So some of the big concepts from the first unit, let's talk about them. What are they? Inflammation. Inflammation is a very good one. Someone left me a love note on my door about inflammation. Actually, it's a love note to inflammation. It's kind of cute. Hopefully that was his class. Otherwise, that's just <laughs> but somebody's really in love with inflammation, which is kind of funny. Um, so inflammation is a big topic. Um, how about immunity? Yes, you should be shaking your head. The specifics and the details? No, not necessarily. Do you need to know if something is, you know, going to be CDA, or are you going to have to classify type of hypersensitivities? Well, the answer to that might be yes, and you'll see that today when we talk about like diabetes and lives, when we talk again about gray disease. So the hypersensitivity classification will come back, but as it really relates to the diseases that we're going to discuss in endocrine, okay? You should be familiar with lines of defense. You should be familiar with acute versus chronic inflammation. Um, I would be familiar with kind of the different phases of inflammation or healing. You, you need to know the difference between, you know, scarring and regeneration. Those are two different processes, okay? And um, Iridium's SI times are, are posted here, and she's going to put them on BB Learn as well. I would highly encourage you, if you didn't attend the SI session for the first exam, make sure you attend uh, SI sessions for the second exam. Because what students will ask is, hey, you know, I want to find out what else I can do to do better in this class. And so one of the first things that I'm going to ask you is, are you going to SI session? And I know that you guys work. I know that you're um, saving baby elephants in other countries. I know that you're volunteering at FMC. I know that you um, are working like three jobs and trying to go to med school. But this is one of your big responsibilities is to do well in this class. That's why you signed up for it, okay? So the exams and the exam weeks are scheduled not just because I'm overly anal about uh, schedule, but it's also so that you guys can plan. And so if you need to ask for a little bit of extra time off before an exam, that might be a good way to do it, okay? Maybe you can get someone to cover your shift so you can go to an SI session. They're really important, okay? I've mentioned this before, Iridium did really well in this class, um, and she's SI'd for me for a couple of, a number of semesters actually, more than just two. And so more importantly than just knowing the material, which is a given for most SIs, uh, she has a very creative way of delivering really the same information, but maybe in a way that's easier for you to understand. 
Uh, in addition to that, she knows how I write my test questions. So you've seen them all over the years. Okay? So she'll likely tell you, like, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Or I would definitely figure that out before running the thing. Okay, those are the kind of things you're gonna hear from her, and that's totally what she's there for. Okay? Plus, a lot of times students find it easier to ask what we call silly questions to the SI. It's maybe not as embarrassing for some reason, okay? So use those resources. Um, I have office hours on Thursday. If that doesn't work for you, I will try my best to make myself available, okay? Any questions about next week? Sir? That's this Wednesday. Yep. So I posted it last week. Um, I will, on the screen, I will um, send out a, a BB Learn announcement um, probably tonight or tomorrow so you guys can but remember the time and the time slot and all that. Okay? All right. I'm writing an astrogram with some colleagues. It's kind of fun. We get to be really nerdy. So I picked this one. When do astronauts eat lunch? Launch time. <laughs> what did one elevator say to the other? What did one elevator say to the other? What's up? What's up? That's good. I like that. I think I'm coming down with something. <laughs> so this might be a glass is half full versus a glass is half empty here, right? All right. How about this one? Why are parallel lines so lonely? Which really because they never meet or they never connect. All right, I see that. Okay. So in this unit, this last unit before the exam, we're talking endocrine. And we need to review a few concepts before we jump right into it. And you'll notice in the reading, you'll notice um, on the free quiz that you finished for today, uh, especially in the reading, there's a lot more content. And we're going to really hone in and focus on a couple of key diseases within endocrinology. And endocrinology is a pretty fascinating field. I don't know if anybody's thinking about moving in this direction. Uh, but it's a very, it's one, in my opinion, it's one of the more challenging fields of medicine. Because there's so much going on. One of my daughters has um, sort of an underactive thyroid. So she's hypothyroid. And she takes a daily thyroxine pill. Um, and it took us a while to figure that out. And pediatric endocrinology is a subspecialty that's quite amazing, quite fascinating. Um, my uh, father-in-law uh, has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And I have a really close friend who was diagnosed with thyroid cancer um, who's recovering or recovered. Um, and the surgical resection for my father-in-law and for one of my close friends uh, really put them in a situation that's very similar to my daughter. And so they take, uh, and my father will need to take, a daily thyroxine. So we're going to talk today about, uh, and that's a very common issue amongst endocrinology is thyroid issues. So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. Another one that we're going to talk about affects the pancreas. And the, any of you read ahead, looked at the slides, and know what kind of uh, diseases we're going to talk about with the pancreas. Diabetes, okay? So we'll look at diabetes, we'll look at type one and type two, <coughs> diabetes mellitus. We're also gonna look at a different type of diabetes today, diabetes insipidus, uh, which is actually a brain issue. It has nothing to do with the pancreas, okay? People mix them up on a regular basis, so we'll, we'll kind of clarify that. But first, what I wanna um, <coughs> go over is really the differences in some of these terms. So if we look at endocrine versus exocrine, so who can define endocrine for us? The hormones that go through the bloodstream. What's that? The hormones that directly go into the bloodstream. Yeah, so these are hormones, or these are gonna be signaling agents that actually transport through the body using the vascular supply. Okay, very well put. So it's a system of glands that releases a product, a hormone, or a signaling agent, and it goes throughout the body It's not fast, it happens more slowly over time. 
And so if we're going to compare and contrast endocrine, before we go to exocrine, to nervous system, right? So the endocrine system allows us to control or modulate homeostatic mechanisms throughout the body more globally. It happens more slowly, but it's widespread. So it's a slow, widespread effect. And with the nervous system, it's much more quick or fast, but it's it typically very localized, okay? So if you want to increase heart rate, and you want to do that with neurons, it's going to happen much more quickly than it will with hormones. With hormones, you have to wait until the signaling agent makes it to the receptor. And with the nerve, it travels either via the speed of, an, of a myelinated fiber, which is very fast, or a non-myelinated fiber, which is still much faster than circulating through the uh, endocrine system. Now, if we look at endocrine versus exocrine, right, because they're very similar words, what is the definition of exocrine? Any ideas? Think back to 201, yeah. Secretion into the environment. Secretion on, into the environment or secretion into a, uh, an orifice or a duct that moves to an epithelial surface, okay? So if you think about exocrine sweat glands, like with 201 and skin, so, it's going into the ducts or it's going onto an epithelial surface that's outside of the body. Exocrine meaning like exit. Then we've got some other terms like paracrine and autocrine. Para is referring to sending a signal, like a hormone, and it's going to affect a nearby or an adjacent tissue or cell. And then autocrine, the word auto means self, so that's where Back to our immunology lectures, we looked at IL-2 being a self or an autocrine signal for activation of T cells. You guys remember that? So IL-2 was a co-stimulatory agent for the activation of T cells, both effector Ts as well as, well as memory T cells. Okay, so just some definitions to, to start us off. So more definitions. When we classify hormones, most often time, they're going to fall into one of these four categories. Peptides, steroids, monoamines, or eicosanoids. And peptides, these are smaller fragments of proteins. They're going to be released into the bloodstream, like what was brought up earlier. That was a great definition. Think bloodstream with endocrine. A steroid, the second type, or the second family, is an organic compound. And the steroids are usually going to utilize cholesterol as a starting agent, a building block. And when you use cholesterol as a starting agent, you're gonna get some example steroid hormones like estradiol, precursor to estrogen, as well as testosterone. Now, if we look at monoamines, and we look at eicosanoids, so monoamines are derived from tyrosine. So some examples that come from tyrosine are norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, as well as the family of thyroid hormones, like T3 and T4. And then our last category known as eicosanoids, we've seen eicosanoids before. We saw them when we looked at the inflammatory section. Does anybody remember eicosanoids, where they're derived from? What's that? Arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid, very good. So this is a review concept, and this would be an example of how it might resurface next Monday on exam two. Right, so the family of eicosanoids that you learned before that I don't want you to forget about, because these are a type of hormone that circulates in the blood. And these were, there were four products that we looked at from arachidonic acid. Does anybody remember them? Thromboxane, prostaglandin, prostacycline, and what was the last one? Leukotriene. Very good. Okay? And they had various roles in inflammation. Do you have to re-memorize their roles in inflammation? No, that's more detailed than is necessary. That's what you had to learn on exam one. But I don't want you to forget that they're in this category of eicosanoids. They're released into the bloodstream. 
they have activity on target tissue to cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Okay? So they're acting as a hormone. Okay, when we look at the activity of these hormones, we see that they have a number of different mechanisms of action. And it really focuses around their receptors. So if we look at the family of receptors, you can see this figure on the upper right. We've got a small stimulus that's going to trigger a hormone to be released. And as that hormone is released, it's going to trigger a cascade of events over time, that's that reaction cascade time is shown, kind of on that y-axis. And the idea is a small stimulus magnifies to a great effect. And that's another thing that is in the classification of, of endocrine or endocrine pathways, is you get a broad, widespread, big effect. And so think about some big hormonal fluctuations that happen in individuals. So you can think about adolescence, okay? You can think about the menstrual cycle. You can think about pregnancy. You can think about spermatogenesis. All of these things produce a very big effect in multiple target tissues, okay? And it doesn't, it just takes an initial stimulus to get things going. In the case of the menstrual cycle, this repeats every 28 days, okay? And it, it fluxes on and then it fluxes off. It's not like it happens in 20 minutes, right? A lot of ladies would say, I would wish it was only 20 minutes long. Okay, it's not, okay? It has a, a ramp up and then a ramp down, a waxing and a waning. And so if we look at the ways to control these things, we can see that these receptors that are specific for a certain hormone are <clears throat> expressed by the nucleus, the DNA is expressed. These receptors are proteins, so they're translated proteins from the messenger RNA, right? So DNA transcribed to mRNA, translated to protein, inserted as a transmembrane protein, right? So there's a specificity from a receptor to a certain hormone. And there's also a saturation point where if you have a few number of receptors, you're only gonna be able to bind a limited number of hormones. And so one way that you can control this is you could actually not just release more hormone, but you could actually upregulate the expression of receptor. And so if you upregulate the expression of this receptor, you amplify the signal by allowing for more hormone to bond or bind to the target tissue, thereby creating a more robust response. Now the converse is also true. If you downregulate the expression of receptors, then you decrease that response. You make that target tissue less sensitive to that hormone. And the relative amount of hormone may be exactly the same, but you're controlling it by upregulating or downregulating receptors. <clears throat> so we'll flash forward. Now I want you to think about this concept when we talk about diabetes. Specifically, we talk about the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So type 1 is where you, you don't make enough insulin, okay? You don't make enough insulin or you become um, um, less sensitive to your type of insulin, okay? But usually it's you don't make enough insulin as type 1. <clears throat> type 2 is you make plenty of insulin, it's you don't respond well to it anymore. That could be a receptor issue. It may have nothing to do with the insulin. You just don't see the insulin and then upregulate glucose transport. Okay? So we'll get back to it, but I want you to think about the slide when we talk about uh, upregulation and downregulation of maybe the insulin receptor in type 2 diabetes. Okay, so as we move on, oops, sorry, um, down our you know, introductory slide, like we always do. We always talk about kind of the background before we move into the diseases. Types of interactions. So we've got different types of hormonal interactions that will vary across the patient. We have synergistic effects, which are greater than the sum, greater than the additive component. We have antagonistic effect, effects where one 
does one thing and another hormone does another thing. We have permissive effects where one hormone makes the second hormone's activity more pronounced. It's not synergistic, but it definitely supports the second hormone's activity by binding the first hormone. So let me give you some examples. So synergistic, greater than the sum. So for adequate sperm production, a male needs both follicle stimulating hormone as well as testosterone. And those two hormones collectively are greater than the sum of their parts. So that's an example of a synergistic effect. Back to the insulin example for antagonistic. <clears throat> insulin lowers blood glucose because it increases the, the signal for glucose to be transported inside the cell. And the antagonistic hormone to insulin is what? Glucagon, very good. So glucagon is released when you want to liberate glucose. Permissive effects, the example for permissive effects, estrogen and progesterone. So estrogen stimulates or upregulates the production of more progesterone receptors. Okay, that's why if you study uh, endocrinology and you look at the menstrual cycle in females, you'll see peaks of estrogen happening just prior to peaks of progesterone. Because the estrogen signal gets the progesterone receptors in higher numbers so that the target tissue, right, the endometrial lining actually is going to respond to that progesterone flux. Now, this next slide is a nice summary slide that talks about kind of all the different pathways within endocrinology. And it looks very simplistic, but it's extremely complicated. And we're gonna talk about just a few of them today. But what I wanna highlight to you is we talk about these endocrine axes. So these endocrine axes where you've got control coming from the brain. So this is the hypothalamus. And we've got our anterior and our pituitary gland, anterior and posterior pituitary gland. And from there, you have target tissues that go throughout the body. And so one hormone is being manufactured, typically a releasing hormone, is being manufactured by the hypothalamus, which through hypothalamic flow moves to either the anterior or the posterior pituitary gland, and then it releases a secondary hormone, usually something like a stimulating hormone, like for example in the axis that goes from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary thyroid releasing hormone, down and targets the thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone, and then the thyroid makes T3 and T4. Okay? So the reason that this gets precarious is if you have a patient that has hypo or hyperthyroid, the question always comes up, is it related to the thyroid only? Always, that's a question. That's a thyroid problem, every time. You won't be in business long as an endocrinologist, okay? Because the thyroid could be responding just fine, making T3 or T4 according to the signal that it gets. So let's say that it's hypothyroid, it's too little. Well, what happens if TSH is too low? If TSH is too low coming from the anterior pituitary, maybe the thyroid is operating just fine and the problem is actually in the brain. It's an anterior pituitary problem. Well, what happens if the anterior pituitary is making the appropriate amounts of TSH according to the signals that it's getting, but the real problem is the hypothalamus because the thyroid releasing hormone levels are low. Do you see what I'm getting at? So you kind of have to back up through this axis to figure out where's the real issue. And that's why endocrinology gets so complicated. And that's just one pathway. But you could ask the same question as it relates to um, ovarian development or oocyte development uh, as it relates to sperm production in males, okay? If you have a sterile individual, so where is the issue? So it's not as straightforward, and you have to be able to be familiar 
with what tissue talks to what tissue and which hormones it uses to do that. Make sense? So we're going to give some examples today. We'll use thyroid as one. Uh, we'll also talk about this one over here with growth hormone. Um, and I'll say it right now and I'll say it later. So growth hormone has broad effects. Growth hormone has broad effects across the body. In fact, some of its effects are related to fat, muscle, and bone directly. Other effects would be almost permissive. Those effects actually have activity on the liver to make more insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor having targets on fat, bone, and muscle, if you're going to grow those tissues to a greater extent with growth hormone, you want to make them more responsive to insulin because then they have more glucose uptake. Does that make sense? So you want to actually grow it and feed it at the same time. And so that's one of the reasons it looks complicated later on, but hopefully you'll remember back to this axis and realize, okay, they actually are in concert with each other, and it makes sense. You just can't build muscle bigger. You actually need to allow it to be more responsive to insulin as well. Okay. So as we continue on, and this is review, all of this really should be review. But the big component that we're going to dial into from a review standpoint is this slide. Because we're going to look at the hypothalamus, which is up top here, as well as the pituitary gland. Now again, there's two lobes. We've got the anterior lobe, right, or the anterior pituitary, uh, the adenohypothalamus, hypothesis, or we've got our posterior pituitary. And the two are actually quite different than each other. In fact, the posterior pituitary is really considered not to be really endocrine tissue per se, because it's really more neuronal tracts that extend from the hypothalamus and they move into uh, the posterior pituitary or the neurohypothesis. So its other name, the neurohypothesis, is um, more telltaling of where it comes from. That tissue is more neuronal tissue than it truly is endocrine. So the adenohypothesis uh, is the front or the anterior pituitary, and the neurohypothesis is that posterior aspect of that lobe. So you can see some of the products that the anterior lobe makes in this pink box. Things like follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, luteinizing hormone, LH, TSH, or thyrotropin, thyroid stimulating hormone, the one that we just talked about, adrenal cortocortic hormone, prolactin, and growth hormone. And then you can see um, in purple the releasing hormones that come from the hypothalamus. And the list is about as long as this list because this one stimulates the release of all of these. And there's really only two products that come from the posterior. The posterior releases oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin is important for uterine and uh, uterine contractions and lactation in females. And then ADH, antidiuretic hormone, or another word for it is vasopressin. This causes uh, arterial uh, contraction or constriction, and it actually preserves water, right, and raises blood pressure. Antidiuretic, antidiuretic means that it prevents the prevents the loss of blood when you urinate, so it helps to concentrate uh, urine, and that's how it raises blood pressure. And that comes from the posterior. We'll talk about a disease that targets ADH here later on. So right on this slide, we've got three main tissues. The hypothalamus, with all the releasing hormones. We've got our endocrine tissue, our real endocrine tissue, that utilizes a portal system. These portal manuals bring the releasing hormone from the hypothalamus to the target tissue of the anterior um, pituitary. And then our third important tissue on this review slide is our posterior pituitary, otherwise known as the neurohypothesis. And this is really more neuronal axonal flow as they originate in the hypothalamus and they move to the posterior lobe. And the two products are oxytocin and ADH. Questions? Okay, so that's like 201 endocrinology in like 15 minutes. Right? 
two up two. Actually, that's two up two, not two up two. Okay, so now we get into the meat. And we're going to start talking about some of the different classifications of endocrine disorders. And in reality, they're relatively straightforward. And what I mean by that is either things go up or things go down. So your disorders are either going to be too much or they're going to be too little. And if it's neither of those two, then it's right in between and it's actually working just the way it's supposed to. So we either have hyper or we have hypo. If we have hyper, um, when we make too much of it, we could see that there is a sort of an adenoma or we could have a tumor, maybe even a non-malignant tumor, and it's functional and it's making too much of the hormone from that tissue. The reason that we would know that it's non-malignant is if it's making functional product from, let's say, it's a tumor in the uh, anterior pituitary and it's making more of the stimulating hormone, then that tissue resembles the native tissue. So it's still well differentiated because it's producing functional hormone. Does that make sense? When it becomes de-differentiated and it stops producing that hormone is when it starts to become metastatic. So a lot of times these functional tumors that are making too much are called an ectopic foci because they're located in a certain region. They produce the hormone. And if you can go in and remove it surgically, you really could correct the problem. Now, some of them are not surgically accessible, okay? Um, hypo is underperforming. So in a hypo situation, you might have a tumor mass, and the tumor mass has grown to a point where it's so large, maybe now it's cutting off blood supply to nearby neighboring functional tissue. And so that nearby healthy tissue is starving, and it stops making functional hormone. So hypo or hyper, depending upon the situation. Now, we also have a secondary category, which is we get abnormal interactions between the hormone and the target organs, like in diabetes mellitus type 2. Or our third category is we've got abnormal target organ response. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Okay, And we'll look at Graves' disease with TSH-stimulating antibodies, which is a hypersensitivity that we talked about before. So we've got really three big classifications, either hypo or hyper, a lot of times due to tumor activity, uh, secondarily, or number two, abnormal interaction between the hormone and the target tissue, or last but not least, the target tissue response is strange. So let's talk about the hypothalamus first, right? The main duty of the hypothalamus, it's our homeostatic regulator. It regulates things like thirst, hunger, body temperature. The Greek translation, hypo, meaning under, and thalamus is a chamber or a room. So it's hypothalamus, it's underneath the thalamus. That's where it's physically located. So you can see in this picture, just to refresh your memory, uh, the thalamus is located here, and our hypothalamus is right below it. And then we've got our um, pituitary gland right here, which is this little sort of sac-like structure that's blown up right here. It sits within this seat of the sphenoid bone, right? So here's a hypothalamus. You've got the pituitary stop coming down, and it's sort of protected by the sphenoid bone in this little uh, outcropping or that cellular tersica. So the hormones that are manufactured by the hypothalamus are listed here. We've got uh, growth hormone releasing hormone or growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Another word for the inhibiting hormone is somatostatin. We have prolactin releasing hormone. Um, we have prolactin inhibitory factor, another name for it being dopamine. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. Thyroid releasing hormone, one that we've already talked about it. And then we've got corticotropic releasing hormone. So any damage to the pituitary gland could affect all or a few or one of the list of hormones that you see there. So what are some things other than the tumor 
that can cause damage to neuronal tissue. Think back to our neurovascular or our uh, neuro, uh, nervous system diseases. Ischemia, okay, so it's a perfusion issue, right? Could be an infarct where it blocks off completely and that would lead to a stroke. Okay, so a patient could have a stroke and there could be a lesion or an infarct or scarring of that, of that neural tissue and then it stops producing functional hormone, right? Could be trauma, although with the hypothalamus it's less likely, or with, I'm sorry, with the pituitary it's less likely because it's sort of protected by the sphenoid bone, so it's almost got a helmet around it within the side of the cranial cap. Okay, but all of those are good ideas as far as um, things that could cause problems. But let's talk about an adenoma. So let's pretend, let's pretend that we have an adenoma and it's targeting the pituitary gland. And it's targeting the pituitary gland and the tissue or the response is you don't get any more um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. So which side of the pituitary is this going to be? Posterior or anterior? The anterior, very good. And then we're going to classify it based upon the type of the adenoma. Okay, so if you had a lesion or a cancerous tumor, an adenoma, and we're targeting the um, pituitary gland, and we're going to have a hyperpituitarism, meaning there's too much, we can either have the adenoma be functional, silent, or hormone negative. So functional is that the produced hormone has clinical effects, right? And that would fit sort of our hyperpituitarism, is it's a functional adenoma producing clinical effects. And our thyroid stimulating hormone um, from our anterior pituitary is going to the thyroid and making the patient hyperthyroid. Or it could be silent. So the adenoma produces hormone, but it doesn't really work. There's something wrong with it. So it doesn't quite make a functional hormone. No clinical effects. Well, in that situation, it wouldn't be hyperpituitary because it doesn't have downstream effects. In the third one, hormone negative, there's no hormone produced. So it wouldn't be a hyperpituitary situation if the hormone isn't being manufactured because then you don't have any downstream effects either. So in a hyperpituitary adenoma situation, it has to be the functional class. Does that make sense? Most of these adenomas are going to be benign. They're going to sit here. They're going to kind of be confined within the anterior pituitary and not really move anywhere else. As they grow, they might get more aggressive. <coughs> As they grow, they get more aggressive, the manifestations increase, right? The clinical sequela grow. And so because of its location, we could get optic chiasm impingement. We could have a variety of different nerves of uh, the cranial nerve family impinged. We get hypersecretion of the manufactured hormone, and that, of course, depends upon where the adenoma is located. And then eventually you might see a switch. You actually might see hyposecretion because that adenoma grows so large, like I mentioned before, and it starts putting pressure on nearby healthy tissue, thus rendering it ineffective. So let's look at a couple of different examples. Um, in the category of giganticism and acromegaly. So if we've got growth hormone that's being overproduced, and remember that axis chart I pointed out, growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor. So they go hand in hand. And remember, growth hormone is going to have activities on a number of different target tissues. For example, like muscle, bone, okay? Um, and Insulin like growth factor is going to also have activity in those same tissues, 
making them more responsive to insulin. So insulin, uh, insulin like growth factor is, is being released by the liver in concert with growth hormone going to muscle bone target tissues. The growth hormone has activity on the liver to crank out more insulin like growth factor. So it makes those bigger bones and muscles more responsive to insulin so that they have more glucose that they can uptake. So in these patients, and I'll get to the pictures here in a second, in these, in these patients, we've got a growth hormone hypersecretion, which causes an increase in metabolic rate. The growth hormone also inhibits peripheral glucose uptake. The result is making it less sensitive to insulin, okay? So you have to make more. And so you get the situation of hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, which are very common side effects that go hand in hand, and they're very similar to what we see in type two diabetic patients. And we'll get there in the, in the later part of this lecture. So these patients, not only do they grow big muscles and bones, but they have a lot of growth hormone, they actually become sort of less sensitive to insulin, so they have to make more. And then the insulin-like growth factor makes the target tissues more effective for uh, bone and muscle more effective for uptaking uh, glucose, but everywhere else in the body is becoming hyperinsulinemic. And so they start developing um, clinical symptoms that resemble type 2 diabetes. Okay, so it's just the muscles and the bones that are growing, and everywhere else is actually not really responsive. So this is a patient up top that developed giganticism, which is the clinical situation when you start releasing too much growth hormone early in life, during childhood and adolescence when the individual is growing. And so an example of a very popularized individual uh, was Andre the Giant. I don't know if you remember Andre the Giant, right? He, um, he was in, in a lot of different movies, he was one of those professional wrestlers. He was a really big man. He's kind of a big teddy bear kind of guy. Um, but um, he died later in life due to the effects or complications associated with enlarged um, heart. So this individual up top is an individual that wrestles with giganticism like Andre the Giant. Their muscles and their bone and their architecture is going to be very large. Okay? Um, in the adult phenotype, once the growth plates close, then the effects of growth hormone don't have the bony architecture that they can make changes onto. And the target tissues become still, are still very responsive to it. And so then you get these um, situations known as acromegaly. Acromegaly is when growth hormone is being produced post-adolescence or in the adult stage of life when the growth plates have closed. And now you start getting bone deformities. You start getting bone deformities that you can see in this lower patient. You get what's called a frontal bossing, a very prominent forehead. You get a heavy brow ridge. Um, you get very masculizing features. This is a young woman, um, probably in her you know, late teens, early 20s. And then as the growth hormone started being released, well after she was full grown, you can start seeing how she changed over time. And you can see her hands here, which you can't see over here, but these hands don't seem like they would fit this young lady, right? So this is acromegaly, which is still a growth hormone issue, but it's a growth hormone issue after the growth plates have closed. So if we move on and we look at other types of issues that happen in the anterior pituitary, we're still in the anterior pituitary, the most common one is this prolactinoma. The most common hormonally active tumor is a prolactinoma. So we start getting a lot of serum prolactin, elevated levels. You can see from this picture, this is the location of the tumor. Here it's pseudo-colored for you so you can actually appreciate it. And this is that optic nerve. So that yellow optic nerve 
is being compressed. So there could be vision issues later in life as it continues to grow. But early on, what usually presents men and women to their doctor are these situations. Galacturia uh, is the spontaneous flow of milk in a female that's not pregnant or not nursing. That would probably surprise you, okay? So you go see your doctor. Amenorrhea is the ceasing of the menstrual cycle. And, and that also goes hand in hand. If pro prolactin is elevated during pregnancy and nursing, and it also ceases the, mens the menses, so that you know the idea, the biological concept is, if a woman is pregnant or is nursing, you want to save that nutrition for that dependent infant, and it's not a great opportunity to have another baby. And so the biology sort of protects the system by ceasing the menstrual cycle uh, when prolactin is high. Now in men, you get a very different response because we're not supposed to have prolactin levels in our blood. And so oligospermia is semen with a low sperm count. And then you have a reduced sexual drive and also erectile dysfunction. And these are detectable levels of prolactin in the bloodstream that would essentially be non-detectable in most men, okay? And so a simple blood test, looking at these side effects would confirm, okay, we have a prolactinoma, I think we better take a picture or get some imaging of your brain. Uh, I'm suspicious that there might be a tumor there. All right, so these are hyper situations, and I want to characterize at least one hypo. Um, actually, we got a couple. Let's we'll characterize a couple of hypos. So in hypo pituitarism, instead of too much, you get too little, and we see this classically with infarctions like post-stroke, traumatic brain injury. Okay. Uh, infections, infections, um, not necessarily meningitis, but it could be a meningitis beginning that actually migrates. So about 10 years ago, we started thinking in the field that um, meningitis or cerebral spinal flow, which is where uh, meningitis sits, um, isn't just in the ventricular system in that subarachnoid space but there is some parenchymal flow that comes through the tissues much more slowly. And evidence of that is that we've got migration and a documentation that certain uh, meningitis cases are actually outside of that ventricular or of that cerebral spinal space. And they find it within the parenchymal tissue of the brain. And so either, there's only one of two possibilities. One is that um, it becomes very leaky with meningital infections, meaning that ventricular network, and that fluid leaks out and infects other tissues, or there's some amount of perfusion that leaves the ventricular system and permeates through the parenchymal brain tissue. And we start now believing that it's the latter of the two. So infections could actually migrate throughout the tissue, or we've got surgical damage. So surgical damage would be a patient has a um, prolactinoma, they surgically remove the prolactinoma and they take too much healthy tissue and now the patient ends up hypo. Make sense? And then the last one is called Sheehan syndrome. So Sheehan syndrome is an in interesting situation, but this is due to a pituitary infarction. This only affects females. It's a pituitary infarction that happens post-delivery. If there's, so, so the, the pituitary gland actually gets much bigger during pregnancy. So you know, my wife and I had four kids, and I, I tell her she's way smarter than me because her pituitary gland is large at least four times uh, in our lifetime so far. So it's at least four times bigger than mine. Now, when the vasculature that develops in a pregnant female for an enlarged pituitary, if there's a lot of hemorrhage during delivery, that vasculature um, is compromised from blood flow, and then there can be an infarction in that bigger pituitary gland. And so if you get an infarction post-hemorrhaging, post-delivery in a, in a, in a female uh, patient, um, you're at risk of developing the Sheehan syndrome, which is a type of infarction, which is the first on the list, but it's really specific to uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Okay.
Okay. So the last one, and then we're going to take a break. And the reason I'm taking a break a little bit earlier than normal is I want to delineate between the two different types of diabetes. And so the first one that we're going to talk before the break is known as diabetes insipidus. So diabetes insipidus is a low antidiuretic hormone secretion. Remember, what does ADH do? Or vasopressin, what does it do? What's that? It retains water, okay? Water is a precious commodity in your body, right? We're like 70% water and you don't want to lose it. And so your brain, this is controlled by the brain, your brain, the posterior pituitary, releases antidiuretic hormone, which has activities on the kidney, and it conserves water loss. It reabsorbs, remember 202? When you actually try to reconcentrate or concentrate the urine and reabsorb as much water as possible, that's where antidiuretic hormone has activity, otherwise known as vasopressin. So if you under-secrete or you under-release it, right, due to an infarction or due to an infection or due to a tumor or to trauma of the posterior pituitary, remember, because ADH is the one of two hormones that come from the posterior lobe, then you end up with this situation known as diabetes insipidus. So diabetes in the Latin, diabetes means siphon or siphon, to siphon. Insipidus means without taste. So if you siphon without taste, right, and you make too little antidiuretic hormone, then you actually have excessive water loss and you get very dilute urine. It's so dilute that it might be tasteless if you were to taste it, okay? Fortunately, we have now analytic tools where we don't actually have to taste it if we're physicians, okay? But they would smell it, okay? They would, smell and taste are very intimately related. So you can smell the urine to determine, is it dilute or is it concentrated, right? I mean, come on, all of you have gone to the restroom and you're like, gosh, my pee smells strong today, okay? <laughs> Maybe you had asparagus, okay? Maybe you're one of those people where you have asparagus and then like 10 minutes later it's in your urine. So you can tell just by looking at it observationally, smelling it. So in the Latin, diabetes insipidus is siphoning taste or without taste. So these patients have severely diluted urine and they have excessive thirst. Excessive thirst is the first P word here, right? This is polydipsia, poly, P-O-L-Y, D-I-P-S-I-A. Polyuria is excessive urination. And then hypernatremia, hypernatremia is elevated sodium in the blood. So you have a very low urine osmolality because you're reabsorbing all, um, uh, all of that uh, salt and you're urinating out all of the water. It's not supposed to be that way, okay? Um, you have a high plasma osmolarity and um, this can be deadly. This can actually be deadly. So there's two main types that can cause diabetes insipidus. We'll talk about the second type, diabetes mellitus, after the break. So diabetes insipidus is up here at the posterior pituitary before the break. Neurogenic and nephrogenic. Neurogenic, obviously the most common form and referring to the brain. And so this is um, a problem with the production of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone that's made by the posterior pituitary. So if it's neurogenic, it could be due to a tumor or head trauma, or infarction. If it's nephrogenic, nephrogenic is um, an over, a problem with the kidney, ne the nephron, right? So this is associated with end-stage renal failure patients due to the inability of the kidney to respond normally to the antidiuretic hormone that comes from the posterior pituitary. So this is, Underproducing antidiuretic hormone. There are rare conditions where you overproduce it. When do you think, it's not even on the, on the list, there's a little, 
not on the slide, there's a little white space at the bottom. When would you anticipate you might see a patient that would not present with the more common scenario of diabetes insipidus, an underproduction, but they actually overproduce it? It's very rare, but you might run into it. What would, what would, when, when do you think you might see that? I'll give you on a hint. We talked about these types of patients last week. When you have, when you have a, a cancerous tumor that's producing functional, right? So it's a, it's a lesion that's functional and it's producing, in the posterior pituitary, that tumor is producing more ADH than normal. But it's, for, for whatever reason, those kinds of tumors are extremely rare. Hmm. I got a hmm out of that. Okay, let's take a break. And, and the real reason I'm taking it early is I want to segregate out diabetes insipidus from diabetes mellitus, okay? See you in five.